to be able to know more about you. So maybe where you grew up and the path that led you and inspired you to do what you do today and um, what got you into journalism. So um, I was born in the UK, so in Belfast, uh, in Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, during the Lebanese Civil War because my parents had left Lebanon during the war and moved to the UK. We often joke that they went from one civil war to another civil war. <laughs> um, and I spent most of my childhood um, between Northern Ireland, Dublin, and then uh, Northern England. So I really um, uh, identify as both, I would say, British and uh, Lebanese. Um, we did return to Lebanon as a family in the early 90s when the civil war subsided. So um, I spent most of my um, formative years, I would say, um, as a teenager and then a young adult in Lebanon. And I think as a child, I was always quite obsessed with the Arab world, this idea that I kind of knew that I was Arab, but I wasn't born in the Arab world. I knew I was Lebanese, but I'd never really been to Lebanon. Um, my mother was so homesick. You know, she would play Feirouz for us at home and she would tell us about how gorgeous Lebanon was. Basically. And there was all this nostalgia, exactly, this nostalgia for the culture and this pride in being Arab. And at the same time, an acknowledgement that there was a conflict, that it was a war zone, we couldn't go home. And um, we grew up watching news. I mean, news was just constantly uh, like a permanent fixture at home. My, my father was always watching the BBC, was always watching the news on the Gulf War, what was happening in Lebanon. And I had this idea in my head that journalists were just heroes. You know, there were portals into this other universe and that universe was my home and they were bringing us the truth. And as a very young child, I felt that. I mean, it must have been about nine or ten. I was obsessed with this idea of news. And I remember I founded this newsletter at school. It was like, you know, we've just hired this new teacher or there's this new sports we can play or here's a crossword puzzle. Um, so that was my first journalistic endeavor, starting an, uh, a newsletter at school. It was called Schools Out. It had a readership of about five people. <laughs> um, and I think that that sort of love for news just grew really over the years. And particularly when I returned to Lebanon, there was never a doubt in my mind that I wanted to be a journalist. I think because of this idea of, of identifying as an Arab um, and wanting to tell the story of the Arab world was just so prominent in my mind as a child who wasn't born in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. It just it just became the path that I was definitely going to embark on. There was never a question in my mind what I was going to do. So then I went to um, the American University of Beirut after attending um, uh, prime, part of primary school and high school in South Lebanon in Saida. And while I was there at the at the American University of Beirut, I was the editor in chief of the student newspaper, okay. um, which was my life. When I think of college, I just think <laughs> of the student newspaper. Be feisty editor. I wanted us to go for all the very controversial stories. Um, we covered what was going on uh, politically on campus because often. Um, what happens nationally is reflected uh, on on campus in university politics, which isn't unique to AUB. Um, and also uh, just really keen to get women into the newsroom. It was a very sort of male dominant to begin with and always had this feeling that women had unique insight. So kind of geared towards social and cultural issues that were focused on women. And I think that that experience just really came to define my career. I did find myself being pushed in other directions at various points in my career, but I always returned to my core commitment, which is telling the story of the Arab world and telling the stories of women as well. Mm. So this is, I think it's a good segue into my book. <laughs> yes, it is. I was exactly just going to lead there right now. Like you're saying, you yeah. want to, you know, women, for women journalists to narrate their own stories, which is something that, you know, needs to be more represented. And that's why um, here we, we go to Our Women Underground, which is an incredible book. And I want it, which I have right here. I praise it every day. <laughs> you're too kind. It's been, been my quarantine companion. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, like, um, so other than what you've said right now, bringing uh, voices of women to life, what, other, what are other reasons that inspired you to bring such a great collection? It's not for me to begin with, because I always felt that as an Arab woman who knows the language, um, who understands the culture, uh, I spent more than half of my life in Lebanon. I know I talked about growing up here, but I very much spent um, 
you know, all of my teen years in Lebanon, um, very much understand the culture and spent most of my 20s in Lebanon too. Um, and felt that sometimes to tell the story of women in the Arab world with the nuance and sensitivity that and sensitivity that's required, you need to be a woman from the Arab world yourself to get closer to the story. So I can give you one example, and this uh, is one that I've only just started to cite um, because it's somewhat a difficult subject uh, to approach, but I think I was about 20 or 21 years old. Um, I had just started working for a local Lebanese publication in Beirut. Uh, and I as I said, I was drawn to social and cultural stories about women. And there were a lot of women who were getting this surgery called hymenoplasty, which is the restoration of the hymen after sexual in intercourse. And again, it's a very difficult subject. It's very taboo. It's very complex. It taps into religious uh, institutions. It, it taps into um, healthcare situation. It taps into this notion of Lebanon being both conservative and having liberal values at the same time and the push and pull of that. And it's just such a, a human story at the same time. So there, there were all of those um, fascinating complex backdrops but at the end of the day this is a woman who's choosing to do something and and um, I was fascinated by that story particularly as I come from a conservative background myself and I wanted to talk to the women who, who were choosing to get this uh, procedure done and it took me a long time to earn their trust but I really did earn their trust and I wrote this story at a time when people were not talking about the subject I think things have sort of progressed in terms of how open people are about talking um, when it comes to talking about sexuality in Lebanon and in the broader Arab world. But at the time, this was in 2003, I think, um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a difficult subject, but one that I was proud of, to, a story that I was proud of because so many women reached out to me after that. For years and years till today, I still get emails from Lebanese women who ask me questions about that story or, or who thank me for writing it. And that to me just really, uh, I really try to refrain from talking about myself and my own reporting because this book is about other women, but I think it does highlight or underscore this idea or this notion of being close to a story as a woman um, telling women's stories is mm -hmm. unique and important. And particularly when you come from the Arab world and you understand the context and the milieu within which you're writing a subject, a, a, a story. So um, that is just one example personally of, of um, how I feel women bring nuance to the story. And then as I continue to grow as a journalist and I worked um, for Bloomberg News in Dubai after I went to grad school, as I said, I was kind of pulled into a different direction because I was covering finance, which was not my yeah. passion really. But what I ended up doing then was just consuming more and more news written by women. So I was drawn to women bylines. I was drawn to stories about women. And I just had, I think, a light bulb moment in particular during the Arab Spring, because I felt there was uh, a lot of attention that was going to Western reporters who had just kind of parachuted into the, into the Arab world, in particular at, at the height of the Arab Spring, or even in the early stages of the Arab Spring. And they were the ones who were being heard, or they were the ones who were commanding the narrative and getting the attention while I was consuming all of this excellent journalism by these excellent women journalists who were Arab and who were doing this work at great risk to their own personal safety and their own lives. And I knew that considering that I'm myself an Arab woman and I, I was always curious about their motivations and the stories behind the work that they do. And we often see memoirs written by Western correspondents about their experiences in foreign lands, you know, and I, and I kind of think, well, what about the actual reporters who are local and who are doing that work on the ground, you know, and who are facing these unique challenges and who have this unique access? I want to read their stories. I often say it's very selfish that I, that I put this book together, but that's a book that I wanted to read myself, right? So um, I, these to go back to the very beginning of the discussion, these women are heroes for me. They really are heroes. Yeah. They're doing this incredible work and bringing us this incredible nuance. And that's what this book is all about. It's about celebrating these women and the work that they do. Definitely, definitely. I mean, reading this book also as an Arab woman myself, I had so much connection, so many relatable stories to the, to the idea of like these gender stereotypes that can be barriers to your ambitions and to the way you want to succeed. And it was also what I found very interesting is the whole idea that you also have women that get 
as different spaces than man because they have different type of access, like checkpoints they could access that man can't, or this, so they would have different stories that needed to be told. So I would say like this is why also an added value to how this book empowers women which was my second question. And uh, I wanted to ask you like, how do you think our woman underground is empowering to Arab women and, uh, and journalists in general? I love this question so much. I mean, I think what it really illustrates as a book is that these women face these challenges. Nobody is denying that they they work uh, under extremely repressive, misogynistic, patriarchal regimes uh, and sometimes societies. I cannot obviously uh, stereotype the entire region. That's something I try to avoid actively. But in some cases, in some contexts, in some countries, in some cultures, this is these are the situations that, that the women have had to contend with. And the preoccupation is not with the challenges per se. None of the women spend much time talking about the challenges. What they're talking about is how they have risen above the challenges, how they have found unique ways to tell the stories, irrespective of those challenges and of that repression and oppression. Um, and I think that is admirable in such a profound way because they're just doing their jobs you know what I mean like they're doing their job for them it's like I need to go to work and in the process of doing this I'm gonna risk my life or I'm gonna anger this regime I'm gonna upset my brother I'm gonna you know put myself in a situation in which I may, might face uh, sexual harassment um, I, I might meet a militia leader and they're just doing it because it's their job and it's not foreign reporting for them. It's not war reporting for them. Their sources are not uh, people they don't know in some cases. In some cases, some of these women were literally like their sources. Zainat Hayim puts it beautifully in one of the chapters. She says, you know, they're my lovers. They're my friends. They're my teachers. Um, they're my family members. You know, it's a personal story for many of these women. Again, not all of them. Um, and that's something uh, I think that the book brings attention to is that the story for them is very high stakes you know there's a lot that they're putting um uh, at risk and sometimes some of these women have families and children you know that uh, even then it becomes even more difficult the risks multiply um and yet they're still doing their jobs the preoccupation is not with the oppressive the oppressive regimes or the oppression they face it's with the work that they're doing and how it's affected them personally and how they've grown Definitely, and that's so empowering by itself to even be able to witness these stories. So yeah, and thanks for saying that. That's something that, uh, you know, some, I love it when I get DMs from, you know, young and aspiring Arab women journalists who say they read the stories of these women and now they feel like they can be journalists too and they want to be journalists too because these women set such great examples. And that for me is the most fulfilling aspect of, of this book, seeing that it's had that knock-on effect. Yeah, I've heard so many good compliments about it, and we're gonna at the end of uh, this con of this meeting, we will. Uh, there's some questions to about some people wanted to ask you, so we'll get into it. Um, so yeah, Ines. And, uh, okay, so now we'll maybe discuss more generally journalism in the Arab world. So although journalism is some sort of a mostly universal practice, do you think that there is a cultural specificity that comes with journalism, particularly in the Arab world? I mean, we saw how it's different for women um, on the ground who are uh, journalists at the moment. And do you think that there is this particular um, sort of specificity that makes journalism face different challenges in the Arab world? I think that's a really good question. And firstly, I, I want to kind of state the obvious, which is it's more difficult to be a journalist in countries in which there's conflict. Um, it's more difficult to be a journalist in countries in which press freedoms are minimal. So many of the countries dealt with in this book and in the Arab world um, and the Middle East rank quite poorly when it comes to press freedoms, whether that is uh, state censorship um, or uh, let's say media outlets that have business interests that control the narrative from from particular newspapers or television channels. I mean, all of that um, feeds into how difficult it is to be a journalist in particular pockets of the Arab world. And obviously, it's unique to each country depending on the situation at hand. So, being a journalist in Syria is not the same as being a journalist in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia 
or in Bahrain or in Morocco. It varies. But, you know, the, I think those are, are important points to make is that if there is a conflict, it, it's going to worsen the situation and make it more dangerous to be journalists. And also in countries that are effectively police states, um, it's also much more difficult. I mean, if you look at, um, I don't want to name police states. I think everyone here knows knows which, which regimes I'm talking about. But if you just look at the broader situation, it's already quite bleak and dire um, when it comes to journalism in the Arab world. It's also politically very, very polarizing. So within particular states, you, you have particular media outlets that have um, political motivations and interests in some of the countries. The media is completely state controlled. So um, at the highest levels, uh, the, the narrative that's, that's being delivered um, is, is effectively a, a controlled narrative. At the same time, you have, in, re in response to all of that, I would say, uh, very, very strong independent media outlets and uh, a lot of citizen journalism as well. One of the media outlets in the book that comes to mind in particular is Mada Mossad in Egypt. Uh, as we know, the editor-in-chief, uh, Lina Atalla, is absolutely incredible, and she was recently detained by Egyptian forces for um, uh, interviewing uh, the mother of a uh, detained activist. I've read about uh, Yes, this just happened two days ago. Um, and this actually really crystallizes, as I said, the difficulties of being a journalist in the Arab world. Um, she was simply arrested for doing her job. Um, and obviously, um, Egypt doesn't fare well when it comes to um, dealing with critics of the state. So that is a, that is a specific example. Uh, and then a lot of journalists across the region um, have been persecuted, detained, um, for doing their jobs in some cases have lost their lives mm -hmm. so that takes me back to the stakes being incredibly high across the region so of course you might see similar patterns in other countries across the world where states effectively control the the media narrative or where there might be um societal instability or conflict or war um, but i think it's the confluence of factors in the middle east in in particular regimes that make it um quite a difficult place to be a journalist, I would say, in, in most of the Middle East. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do you think, I mean, the work that you've done is incredible in the sense that it sort of brings to light all these difficulties. And do you think that perhaps providing more platforms like the one you did uh, on the cultural arena to sort of expose these testimonies, uh, do you think that can help mitigate uh, what Arab journalists are facing today in their respective countries? I think it, uh, it amplifies their work in a crucial and critical way because their, their work and the reporting that they do is um, crucial to our understanding of the region at large, particularly in, I would say, the global um, media space when it comes to international mainstream media. As we know, there are particular corporations that dominate the narrative in that respect. And I think the more we amplify the work of local journalists and the more we get their voices out there or, pa or have the mic over to them, um, the more uh, people will begin to understand that it is necessary to have diverse uh, newsrooms and diverse bylines uh, in understanding a region, any particular region, it's necessary to have that. And um, so often as well, just to kind of take this slightly in a different direction, a lot of the news that comes out of um, Western media publications actually uh, relies on stringers and locals who don't get the credit um, for particular reasons. A lot of these stringers cannot reveal that they're doing that work for their own safety. And I recognize that. But what we need to understand more broadly is that people are doing that work and we need to amplify that work and we need to celebrate that work and we need to acknowledge that it is absolutely critical that we get these voices into the mainstream, that they're not on the periphery, that they become part of the mainstream. Thank you. Um, okay, now we'll move on to the question from a student at the Journalist School of Sciences Po who wanted to ask you. 
so the message says, Hi Zahra, thank you for doing this chat and thank you especially for our women on the ground. I know many journalists who've read it and it's made a lot of people think twice about the desire to report abroad and what they bring uh, that a local journalist wouldn't, for example. Uh, and they wanted to ask a couple of questions. So first, uh, on the question of representation in the media, what do you think is the way forward for newsrooms? Should they adopt some sort of policy or quota to ensure there's a diverse staff? And secondly, do you think that with the rise of freelancers and local independent media organizations, the idea uh, and the job of the foreign correspondent might one day become obsolete? Those are both excellent questions. Let me start with the first one. I think absolutely newsrooms need to recognize that they need to have diverse bylines. And, and um, I mean, when I say bylines, I mean, they need to hire more and more uh, people of color or people from the particular regions that they are uh, featuring reporting from. I think it's actually starting to happen in some pockets. I think some media outlets are better than others. I think Reuters, for example, is really good at it. I think the Associated Press is really good. Um, I think, you know, there's a long way to go. Uh, but yes, I would definitely say that representation should be a priority when it comes to hiring. I will definitely say that. And also from personal experience that I think it is critical. Um, and that's, you know, something I argue in my introduction in the book as well. Um, and, it, and it's also, it, it's something that I feel passionately about because I feel that I, I often say it's not to take down the work of others, what I'm trying to do. It's to highlight that you need a complete narrative or you need a broader narrative. Without the voices or without, uh, let's say, an Arab uh, byline covering or an Arab um, reporter covering the region, um, it's just not, you're not telling the full story because you're not getting, you're not getting the nuance and the insight that you need. So. I definitely advocate for more diverse newsrooms. How the various publications globally should be handling it, that's something else, you know, in terms of quotas and so on, but I would just advocate for more diversity. Even if I just look in the UK, for example, with all of the coverage of the Muslim community in the UK, um, I think less than a percent of journalists in the United Kingdom are of Muslim origin, um, even though there's about four to five percent um, population of, of, of the UK's Muslim population. So. Um, again, and that, that comes down to representation, this idea of how much are you covering a particular community and uh, do you have anyone from that community who's participating in that reporting? Um, and the second question on whether or not, can you just repeat it? Um, because I... Yeah, sorry. Um, so do you think with the rise of freelancers and local independent media organizations, uh, the idea and job of the foreign correspondents might one day become obsolete? I mean, I don't... I don't hope for it to come up obsolete. Uh, I do want to clarify that. I think that um, foreign reporters do excellent work, truly excellent work. Um, and I don't, I, I do think that um, media organizations will always uh, feel that they need to send their own to mm. a foreign land to bring the story back to their own audience. And I kind of understand that structure. Um, my feeling is that it can be problematic if you're not incorporating other voices. Um, I think that freelancers do excellent work and they can dent that structure, but I think they don't get the same protections as full-time reporters do when they're hired by a media organization, which is why I'm a bit hesitant to say I hope the idea of, you know, I hope foreign correspondence becomes obsolete. I think it's necessary. Rula Khalaf actually, who's now the editor of the Financial Times, um, writes an entire chapter on the importance of, of foreign correspondence. Um, I also kind of don't necessarily, um, I just, I look at a good reporter as a good reporter. So whether or not you're foreign um, is something else. I think if you are from the country of origin, you tend to bring a different story or a different side or a different insight. And that's what I'm trying to say here. So my goal is not for, you know, people to think that this, like foreign cars, you know, foreign correspondence in general is problematic. It's just the structure can be problematic. And also there is a very dated notion um, of the, like the foreign correspondent being like white and Western and not knowing anything about the region and then parachuting in and then writing a story and getting all the attention and then leaving and then writing a memoir. This still exists to an extent. It's dated. 
it's it's a lot better. There are a lot more women doing that work, for example, of Western origin. A lot of great women of Western origin are in the Middle East doing great work. Um, but it still exists structurally and these people still get celebrated. Um, so I just would hope that that particular notion of the foreign correspondent gets redefined and reworked. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Zahra.